happens to uh, refined grains? What happens to the vitamin uh, content after we refine grains? Well, you can see this right here. Whole wheat, you could see, has much uh, greater concentrations of almost all of these vitamins. And you can see what happens here to all these other vitamins. We started to um, <coughs> enrich our flour after World War II with these three B vitamins and iron, and I'll show you that here in a minute. And then since 1998, we've put folic acid, not folate, back into our diet. And it's turning out that's my, probably not a very good idea. It's increasing our risk for prostate cancer. It reduces the risk of neural tube defects in infant, but it's a, it's a kind of a pyrrhic victory. It's a trade-off that doesn't seem to work very well. Okay, well, let me go back one other point. So <clears throat> when you take out all the vitamin B6, and you take out all the folate, this increases a chemical in our blood called homocysteine, which irritates the lining of our arteries and promotes cardiovascular disease. And this is what happens to the mineral concentration of flour, and you can see all the minerals get knocked out completely, and there's a whole bunch of diseases associated with it. The calcium that's available in whole grains is bound to a compound called phytic acid or phytate, so we actually don't get any of this calcium anyway. And these are the, some of the diseases associated with uh, poor calcium intake. Now, if, if you decide to do the paleo diet and you go to your physician or your nutritionist and say, look, I'm gonna cut grains, whole grains out of my diet, they're gonna go, oh my God, where are you gonna get your fiber? You're gonna have no fiber, you're gonna be constipated for the rest of your life. Um, that's not true. If we look at whole grains and we contrast the fiber content to a 1,000 kilocalorie sample, notice that we have almost twice as much uh, fiber in fruits and non-starchy and non-starchy vegetables. It's completely off the roof here. So uh, this is a myth, and uh, fiber has important uh, effects on our health, particularly the types of fiber that are in fruits and non-starchy vegetables. There's soluble fiber versus the insoluble fiber in whole grains, except for oats, which has a little bit of soluble fiber. And so there's the laundry list of diseases for the gastroenterologists in the crowd. And some of these aren't completely bought into, so some of these have changed a little bit. How do we know our ancestral diet, we didn't have dairy products? Okay, so take a look up here, look at this. Uh, you know, anybody ever try to walk up to a wild animal? <laughs> How about doing this to it, you know? <laughs> it's just not gonna happen. See, you have to domesticate an animal before you can milk it. And so people simply couldn't have had dairy products in their diet until we domesticated animals. This is how the numbers come in for dairy products. You can see we eat about 10% of our calories as dairy, and this is how it mixes up. And so you've already seen this slide. This is when we first find evidence of dairy in about 9,000 years ago. And what's the problem with dairy? dairy products they have a really weird fatty acid balance. All foods, fat, fatty foods or animal foods, are a mixture of polyunsaturates, monounsaturates, and saturated. But you can see here, if we look at wild animal tissue, we have a pretty good mix between monounsaturates and polyunsaturates, and we have a lesser amount of saturated. But we have a very, very good mix. Whereas with dairy products, you can see we have low levels of polyunsaturates, and very, very high level. And so if you include a lot of fatty dairy foods, it tends to imbalance fatty acid and tends to promote some um, diseases. Now, I, I, I've kind of reversed my position a little bit on the saturated fat thing, and I think most of the world has started to see a little bit different perspective. So in terms of increasing the risk for heart disease, it does, but it depends on what you replace saturated fats with. If you replace saturated fats with carbohydrate, you're in worse shape than starting off with saturated fats. That's what the most recent information shows. So what we ought to be doing is replacing saturated fats with what we had in our diet originally, monounsaturates and polyunsaturates. This is a very healthy profile. Okay, so if you look at dairy products, and we talked about the glycemic index and how that promotes many, many diseases, you'll notice that refined grains have really high glycemic indices but come down here and look at milk and yogurt. My God, look at how low they are, 27 and 24. At least in theory, they ought to be healthy foods. But work from our laboratory right here, this is one of my graduate students, Garrett Hoyt, turned out differently. And what we found is that they 
not our insulin levels sky high. It's just like eating cookies, okay? So let's take a look at that data. And you can see here that all dairy products have very, very low glycemic index. That means they don't jack our blood sugar levels up. But paradoxically, look, at, compared to white bread, yogurt has an insulin index that's even higher. So all of these dairy products have these enormously high insulin index. And there is at least one experiment in children showing that this it produces insulin resistance. A high dairy product or a high dairy diet for only a one week cause insulin resistance in children. That experiment hasn't been repeated yet in adults, and that's what we want to do in our laboratory. 